Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm really glad you all came back for day two. We covered a lot of ground yesterday with uh, sequencing and assembly and mapping. Um, you know what Fred's scores are. You know, high scores are good. That's good. Um, today, we're going to be moving into a rather different area. So we're moving from what uh, kind of the standards of genomics and, and how we go about sequencing things to shifting into transcriptomics. Now, oddly, we, we talk about genomics and proteomics rather a lot, but transcriptomics as a term is kind of banished. Instead, the, the, the term we frequently see connected with it is gene expression. And so uh, we're going to spend a lot of our time today talking about gene expression and the informatics associated with it. How do we get to uh, difference lists of genes that we feel are confidently different between pairs of cohorts? Still getting some clicker. So we're going to start with a just justification for it. Why, why is it that uh, gene expression is a, a really useful place for us to be working? Um, and from there, we're, we're going to move on to talk about technologies. Now, I'm going to be talking about a lot of things that were developed in connection with microarrays. And that can seem like a, a very old school approach, but in fact, a lot of the informatics uh, changed relatively little between uh, the, uh, once you've got mappings in place at least, um, between microarrays and RNA-seq style experiments. So we'll talk about a bit of each and why one would, why, why one would select a, an approach based on RNA-seq rather than microarrays. Um, all right, so from there we're gonna move uh, on to two of the most commonly used techniques uh, for making sense of these data, uh, which is by clustering specifically, uh, and difference testing. But as soon as difference testing comes into play, we really need to have a chat about statistics. Uh, so, uh, about uh, things like multiple testing correction and so on. So, the, the end of our lecture will really be about some of the things we can do to avoid some traps that show up in uh, experiments otherwise. So, what is it about gene expression that makes it so valuable? The, the way that I often describe this to, to newcomers to our field is that our, uh, our, our genomes act as a catalog. These are all the different products that our bodies might order. Um, now, if I'm a cell sitting in Dave's brain or a cell sitting in Dave's skin, which products I'm gonna order are gonna be quite different, right? Uh, so if you want to understand uh, the genome of a thing, you just need to sequence it once, basically, and, and annotate it. Um, but the, the, the challenge with gene expression is that which products are ordered at, at what magnitudes has all kinds of impact on, on those cells. The, uh, to understand how a cell's product orders, uh, how its transcripts differ from another cell's, or to understand why it's, uh, how, how it's responding to long-term challenges. Uh, all right, so gene expression is wildly regulated. There, there's a full year class that we offer to all of the students in the interdisciplinary graduate program uh, at, uh, at Vanderbilt University, and it's all about gene expression. The, the ways that we control which products get ordered by cells is, it, it's, it's a, a complex project. So I, I would admit that we can talk about uh, mutes versus wild types, right? Especially people working in cancer research, we often find that if you have a, uh, uh, say, an oncogene that you're affecting and you want to know how does gene expression change in response to that, that might be a, a, a way to, uh, the, Measuring transcripts might be a way to get some purchase on that question. Of course, um, our cells don't just sit around completely ignoring their environments. So understanding which drugs are in the environment, um, what, where is the light, um, even some, some meta things like how, how long did you sleep last night? And one of the things we don't say to graduate students often enough is did you get enough sleep? I, when, when I hear of students say, well, I'm going to do an all-nighter before I do my presentation for the department, I say, stop that nonsense right now. You're going to do no such thing. I'd rather you get a full night's sleep and do a chalk talk than have gorgeous slides and have no idea where they came from, right? So sleep has a big impact on uh, how we function, and it has a big impact on things like gene expression as well. Certainly different developmental stages are going to have very different needs. There are, there are plenty of genes that um, may play uh, quite a heavy role in fetal development, but haven't seen daylight since then. You know? So having uh, different developmental stages have their own sets of uh, transcripts is also likely. Different cell types we've already mentioned. 
Certainly, uh, a muscle cell is going to have something very different going on for it than fibroblasts in your skin or a neuron in your brain. And disease states versus health uh, can, can be a really huge determinant. So if you were looking at uh, diseases that have massive effects on the transcripts we select, you might want to choose something like cancer, for example, which, which has, is a, 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 a disease of significant dysregulation uh, for, for gene expression. So there are lots of reasons why you're going to find different expressions at different time points. Generally speaking, we assume that the number of messenger RNA copies in a cell for a particular gene is our indicator of corresponding protein level. And that might seem like a big duh, right? Um, that we have, if, if you have more transcripts, you have more protein. In fact, this is a really bad simplification of a very complex process. We have lots of ways in which a messenger RNA may be present, and yet it is not translated. There are plenty of ways that you may be producing lots of protein, and yet it's being degraded very rapidly as well. So although I'm going to just put this little hypothesis up here, that more mRNA means more protein for that same gene, th this is only true so far as it goes. We don't want to rely on that statement and assume that lots of transcript always implies lots of protein. We can talk about this a bit more if you like, but uh, the, the way that uh, the protein life cycles uh, turn out is, is a very complex process. Okay, any questions so far? Now, one of the things that uh, we find among biotechnologists is that um, they tend to, to fall in love with a particular class of molecule. I worked in proteomics for 20 years, and I gotta say, proteins are cool. They're really amazingly diverse. The kinds of things that they can take on is astonishing. And yet, when I sp spoke to a friend of mine who was a geneticist, he explained that proteins are just DNA's way of making more copies of itself. I think that sort of understates the importance of transcripts and the importance of proteins. So let's think about this from a phenome perspective. You know, if we have a phenotype at, at, at the end of the organism, if you study just the genome, you're all the way at the left of this figure. The genome describes what's possible in terms of products that this body can make, but it doesn't tell you much about what's happening in this particular site or under these particular circumstances. For that, gene expression, transcriptomics, is a, a very valuable asset. Now, now we're learning about which parts of this magazine of products um, we're, we're actually making our orders from. As I mentioned, the way the, the concentration of proteins is not something that simply falls out of the mRNA number. You can't just say, well, there are 1,000 copies of this transcript, therefore there are 5,000 copies of this protein. It doesn't work that way. So, Every step we move from genes to the transcripts to the proteins that, are, uh, that correspond to those transcripts is getting a little closer to biological function. Because in a lot of ways, proteins are the actors of the cellular stage. However, if you were able to measure all of the different metabolites that are present in a, a sample at a given time, you would have a much more comprehensive appraisal of the, the current metabolic state of that, uh, of that. And from this, emergent properties like phenotype come about. So if you study genome only, you're getting the, the most abstract portrayal of the organ system, <coughs> or the, the organ the system, or the, the organism, or the disease that you're studying. Getting to transcriptomics gives us a lot more appraisal of how gene expression is taking place. If we study the proteins, we get a sense of what what active uh, molecules are still going on, or understand directly what reactions, uh, uh, what, what uh, uh, balance of metabolites has resulted from, from which uh, phenotype becomes more apparent. Everyone remembers transcription is quite different between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, correct? Does everyone remember that this is different? Okay. So the way that a gene is structured and the way that the transcript, uh, the resulting transcript is structured, changes quite a lot between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. But it helps, I think, to remind ourselves a little bit of 
<coughs> first, all, uh, first off, does everyone remember what a, a polycystronic operon is? Well, very frequently in prokaryotes, a whole bunch of genes, often that are all one pathway, are all transcribed as a set. That instead of making transcripts from gene A and gene B and gene C from the pathway separately, one cistron contains that whole assemblage, and one transcript is produced to cover that entire operon. So we, we see in this case two ORFs. Does everyone remember ORF? An, an open reading frame. Right. So we have UTRs. Those are untra uh, untranslated regions. So we have these ordering the ORFs. We have start and stop sites. Um, we probably have some sort of regulation here as well, things like promoters, enhancers, and silencers. So which genes are going to be expressed at a given time is going to, to, to vary quite a lot. And most of that interaction probably comes about in these yellow regions. And then the single transcript is produced, and different protein coding regions are marked by RBSs. Does everyone remember RBSs? Ribosome binding sites. Right, so one transcript has multiple places for ribosomes to dock initially, representing the start of the translation, basically. Okay, so one cistronic transcript results in multiple proteins after the other day. Okay, good to remember that these things can be very, uh, very different. Now, we might also imagine a similar regulatory apparatus around uh, a, a eukaryotic gene. However, I would note that these little gray dudes here are an addition that, are, that add quite a lot of flexibility. I, I think you remember yesterday I mentioned that we may have 20,000 genes for humans, protein coding genes for humans, and yet the number of protein sequences that we can produce is much larger than that. And a lot of why boils down to these little gray regions, the introns. So in this case, we have three exons for this gene, they're separated from each other by these introns. Initially, a pre-mRNA is generated that spans all of that, and then splicing takes place. The splicing removes the introns and may select among different exons that are to be uh, part of the mature messenger RNA. That messenger RNA, in turn, produces a protein. So it may be that a given gene's expression is not changing a lot in the process of disease. And yet, which transcript gets chosen may be changing. Because there may be multiple sets of exons you can bring together to create a functional protein from the same initial transcript. Okay, so those are pretty big differences. We don't see cistronic structures typically. Um, there are cases in which, for example, a uh, a protein gets chopped uh, in order to uh, take on multiple roles. But uh, generally speaking, the, uh, what we see in the case of gene expression is that which exons are being expressed matters as well as just the bigger picture of which genes are being expressed. Now the next thing, and this is probably uh, more apparent to people who work on the bench than, than it is to me, but I've been told that messenger RNA is sensitive. It's a, it's a little pesky, and if you look at it, squint at it, suddenly it's gone. There, there are lots of, um, lots of enzymes out there that enjoy digesting messenger RNA. Um, messenger RNA is not generally intended to stick around for a long, long time. So we have lots of mechanisms out there that destroy it. So, one of the first things that we're going to do as part of many transcriptome experiments is create a, a longer-lived copy in DNA. And for this, we're typically going to use um, we're going to use this reverse transcription process. Okay, so do human cells make use of reverse transcription? Yes. Typically not. It does. Why about when HIV pops into Ah, right, so when viruses infect our cells, many of them encode a reverse transcriptase. So they confer on our cells the ability to rewrite DNA 
out of RNA. And yesterday, when we were talking about um, non-coding DNA and uh, pseudogenes and alus and things like that, a lot of those uh, retrotransposons have the ability to make RNA copies of themselves and then rewrite into the DNA that messenger RNA. Okay, so, um, so we do see that mechanism is used within our genomes. Generally speaking, it's due to a reverse transcriptase that came from somewhere else. Okay. So we can make use of reverse transcriptase in the lab by creating a primer um, against one end of our messenger RNA. So in this case, I'm showing a primer uh, for the three prime end of the messenger RNA. And in eukaryotes, that's a really nice place to target because almost all of these messenger RNAs have a poly A tail on them. So if you have a poly T primer, you can stick that onto the back end of the, uh, of the transcript and created a reverse complement in DNA. So we call that a complementary DNA uh, uh, complement. Uh, this is not the only type of primer that gets used in this context, uh, but it's uh, a common approach. If you combine that with a bit of polymerase chain reaction, you will be able to not only um, generate the cDNA copy, but amplify as well to create a, a stronger signal to work from. I want you to, to, to lay in the caution, though, that if in gene expression you're trying to ask a quantitative question about expression, you need to be really cautious about also using PCR, because PCR can distort the numbers of molecules um, so, such that um, one that had twice as many copies as another in the first case may no longer have that two-to-one relationship after you use an exponential process like PCR to amplify. Um, Basically, uh, if the, the more you turn up your stereo, the more uh, the more difficult it gets to make out the lyrics. But the bumps, the, the bump, bump sound is still good, right? So, our our retention of quantitative information in transcripts diminishes by doing heavy amplification up front. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about the technologies that we use for measurement, uh, and we're going to start. Um, with a, a couple definitions, of course. Now, the transcriptome here is the set of messenger RNA molecules, the transcripts, that are produced in cells. That's all very good. Almost all of the technologies that we use for this purpose are built around hybridization. Does everyone remember what hybridization is? Mm, not a lot of head shakes on that one. I kind of would have expected it. All right, well, hybridization reflects the way that hydrogen bonds form between two strands of DNA, right? So if you have a CG pair or an AT pair, those are forming hydrogen bonds that basically allow the DNA to form this nice and zipper structure. All right, I'll, I'll ask a, a, a properly formed trivia question here. Which pair of DNA bases offers more hydrogen bonds than the other? GC. GC, great, okay, good. So G and C we form a, 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 a triple hydrogen bond as opposed to the double hydrogen bond that we see in A T pairs. Great. So um, if you have fluorescently labeled cDNA from your sample and you incubate that with a microarray that's covered with little probe sequences, the formation of hydrogen bonds between the labeled sample cDNA and the probe sequences is what we're relying upon that we don't expect a lot of off-target hybridization, that if the sequences aren't complementary between the cDNA and the probe sequences, nothing's going to happen. It's not going to stick. If it did, the consequence would be a whole lot of background light that reflected non-specific interactions. So we want these probe sequences to, uh, to uh, hybridize only with uh, their, their true complement sequences. In fact, a lot of the earliest microarrays use something called mismatch probes. That instead of having just the probe sequence on the plate, you would also have one that had a direct, uh, had a intentionally different sequence uh, that, that just differed by one nucleotide from the, the proper probe sequence. And they would use that as a, as a reference to say, how much background do we get by what matches to the mismatch probe versus what matches to the real thing. Okay, um, a lot of the approaches that we use today are not based in microarrays. Instead, they're built around sequencing. So RNA-seq has 
stolen the lunch, basically, of microarrays. That's not to say that microarrays are dead, however. There are probably more people using microarrays now than, than were in the heydays of the late 1990s. Um, there are some reasons for that we're going to get into. But it is possible to work with sequencing-based approaches rather than these hybridization-based um, uh, uh, array approaches. But I want to note that these, are, these have two different readouts. Right? The, the amount of light you get from fluorescence is your readout for a microarray. More copies of, uh, of DNA uh, annealed to the, this probe, and the, the more light you're going to get. Um, in sequencing, we no longer have this kind of continuous signal to work from. Instead, we have a count. Because out of these millions of reads that we've produced, we're going to count how many of them aligned to this particular gene. So we're, we're switching from a, 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 a continuously distributed intensity signal to a count-based um, sequencing based signal. Okay, DNA microarrays are a brilliant bit of technology. Has everyone heard of photolithography? Ah, photolithography is one of these little miracle technologies that have brought us to the 21st century. We're in the 21st century, right? 21st century. If we didn't have photolithography, we wouldn't be here. It's just how it is. So, um, DNA microarrays. Um, are very fre frequently produced through uh, synthesized arrays. We're going to talk about photolithography in just a moment. So imagine then that we have a Cartesian array of DNA on a microarray. Cartesian array. Has anyone heard the name Cartesian? It's from Rene Descartes. Everyone remember Rene Descartes? Major philosopher. Very important to do. Um, Rene Descartes uh, brought us a lot of interesting things, but at the moment, I'm going to remind you of algebra class in high school when you had xy plots and you, you were asked to plot points to say, okay, this one's at uh, you know, three on the x coordinate and five on the y coordinate. Remember that stuff? Ah, no one had the flashbacks with you know, twitches. That's good, that's good. So a Cartesian array is an xy grid. Okay, so you can imagine these microarrays then are these XY grids, and each spot within that is covered with this lawn of the same probe sequence many, many, many times. All right, so that that lawn uh, is sitting attached to a solid surface like a glass slide or a silicon chip, um, and that grid is going to have different addresses, each address corresponding to a different probe sequence. Okay, now in the very first arrays, we frequently used spotted or printed arrays. Does anyone still have an inkjet printer at home? I switched to laser, I'm not going back. <laughs> All right, so back in the old days, uh, if, if you were interested in printing photos for your mother, we really, really should print more photos for our mothers, I mean, this is true, um, you should get, you would get yourself an inkjet printer because they could print color very accurately. Now, is that because these inkjet printers had uh, a, a different well for each of 16,000 colors that, that our eyes can tell apart. It's not, right? So they had basically four colors, typically. And the mixture of those four colors would cause your eye to see the color that was in the, in, in the image. All right. Now, this is a little different than how these spotted or printed arrays work, because they really were working from uh, many different tubes that, can, uh, that contained uh, different probe sequences that should be put onto these. Now, necessarily, this limited the number of different probe sequences that you could uh, spatter onto this glass slide that you were depositing it onto. So spotted or printed arrays were great, but generally they were relatively low density. So synthesized arrays became very, very popular instead. So in this case, we, we create in situ the probe sequence. We grow the probe sequences right on the, the silicon surface. And that brings us to photolithography. All right, there are three Greek roots in there. I think most people are going to be familiar with photo, which relates to light. Good, yep. Litho. Litho. Stone. OK. So light, stone, and graphene. Writing. Right. 
So writing stone with light. What a wild term, right? Photolithography is how we make microprocessors. Photolithography allows us to very carefully mask and unmask various regions of something for the, the deposition of, of new structures there. So we can grow transistors on, 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 uh, out, of, out of silicon by masking and unmasking regions with light using lasers. So in the same way, we have some wafer. We have some mask on it. Now here, we're using usually a laser to burn holes in the mask at certain sites. And now we add in T nucleotides, and we allow them to attach to these unmasked OH points. Now we have T nucleotides on just those spots that were unmasked. And we can remask and then, and then uh, specify new locations where we're going to add another nucleotide, add in some C's, and now we have C's at those locations. So essentially, if you wanted to, um, to lay down the, uh, the sequence uh, ACT, at, at a particular spot, you would burn a hole in the mask, you would do a round of adding uh, A nucleotides. You would, so, so all the sites that were unmasked would now have an A on them. You'd remask. Again, burn a hole through the mask at that site, add C, which allows the C to stick to the A that was just deposited there, remask. Unmask that site, stick on a T. So effectively, we are growing DNA on the plate itself. It's an amazing technology. You can use this to build transistors. You can use this to build probe sequences. If you wanted to make a probe of 25 bases, that's 25 rounds of unmasking that site and adding the corresponding nucleotide. OK, um, the, the great benefit of this is that, that your ability to create a feature, a particular spot of DNA sequences, is limited by how accurately you can unmask a particular location on the, on the slide. And the, the lasers that we use for today's microprocessors allow us feature sizes of 10 nanometers. 10 nanometers, that's a very small feature. So you can create extraordinarily high densities of probe sequences on a silicon plate. I'm not under the impression that we use 10 nanometer lasers in this, in, in the case of micro, but there's I don't think there's a reason why that's inherently more difficult than doing it with a, uh, making a, uh, a microprocessor. Now, I, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about microarrays, but I want you to keep in mind that you may be working with microarray data that aren't a microarray at all. A lot of the microarrays that we use today don't have a Cartesian grid at all. Instead, they're built around beads. So these little three micron beads are, uh, are quite powerful because these beads are covered with a lawn of the same probe sequence, right? So maybe this, this particular bead represents actin, uh, and it has probe sequences, all the uh, identical probe sequences all over it corresponding to, act, uh, to actin. And it has the ability to report which uh, probe it's covered with. By, uh, by hitting it with a laser, you get back uh, a pattern of fluorescence that gives you a, uh, its address, basically. What kind of gene do I represent? We then have these silicon wafers that have little pits in them. The beads come along and, and get arrayed in those pits like this, which gives us the ability to read each one serially and determine how, uh, which, which gene does it represent and how many, trend, uh, how many cDNA molecules are bound to it. So this is, um, this is not a microarray per se, but the way that the data get interpreted is essentially the same thing. We sometimes see this used for gene expression. Bead arrays are probably more commonly used for SNP uh, or, or for, uh, for variant sequence determination. So if you were trying to understand a person's genomic background, yes, you could sequence them, but it might be a whole lot more efficient 
to simply create an array that represents uh, the genetic variation in that person's population and then detect which, which variants they have at each of these bazillion locations. Right? That's, that doesn't require sequencing, but it does give you a very accurate depiction of their genetic background. Okay. So we're not going to, we actually don't have a lecture in this week about uh, genetic difference, uh, about, uh, for example, genome-wide association studies, GWAS, uh, but that's one of the, the topics that we discuss from time to time in bioinformatics. I'm, I'm sure there's a lecture about that uh, recorded on my YouTube channel if it really interests you. But today we're going to focus just on gene expression, not on detecting variants. Great, so we've talked about microarrays, we've talked about spotted and synthesized microarrays, we've talked about, uh, about bead arrays as well. But what about RNA-seq? Now, why is it that RNA-seq has become so incredibly popular? If instead of producing sequencing reads from a shivered up genome, if instead you started from the messenger RNA that was present in somebody's cells, you would get a, uh, you, by, by measuring the cDNA from that person in a sequencer, you're going to get a, a very deep look at the, what genes are expressed in that person's cells. So one of, the, one of the things that people would worry about is that if you measure someone's gene expression by microarray, you're going to have some amount of background light that interferes with your ability to detect very, very small signals. Right? If you have 10 transcripts in a person's cells um, that you're trying to measure for a particular gene, are you going to get a very faint amount of light that, that tells you, ah, there's, there's exactly 10 transcripts? Not really going to happen, especially if you know, you've done an amplification up front. So, um, so frequently, at the background level, just a, a little bit of light that shows up everywhere really interferes with our ability to detect very faint signals. Today's sequencers produce such a read depth for, uh, for, for transcriptomes that we're able to get a much more sensitive appraisal of expression by using sequencing rather than the microarray approach. Okay, so uh, you can imagine then that we have some gene structure and we're able to produce reads spanning across that structure. It may be that we have multiple transcripts that can be read through a series of exons, right? If you have exon 1, 3, and 4, you get a diff different sequence out than exons 1, 2, 3, and 4. So there's a lot of possible, um, possible forking and branching that we observe as we move through a gene's structure, through its, its exon graph, uh, if, if you'll let me use that phrase. So how do we make use of these data? I'm going to try to talk about that in terms of what we already know about that organism. So we've, we've already settled that the human genome was published, at least, in 2001. And we would consider it a relatively mature uh, annotation at this point. That's not true of all organisms we would work with. But what about something like Baker's yeast? Mature or barely known? Mature. Very mature. Yes. Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a really, really well-known annotation. Does that mean it doesn't change from version to version? It still changes. People are still arguing about how many protein coding genes there are in yeast for that matter. So no, no annotation is finished, but there are some that are very incomplete. I remember when I uh, first looked up the American alligator, uh, the alligator had been covered in an NIH project to 2x coverage. They justified it as an agricultural species. Did you know alligators are agricultural species? I've been to restaurants that serve alligator, it's really tasty actually, but a little greasy I must say. All right, so we have some annotations out there that are very mature and some that are very, very immature. Let's consider the human case. We have a reference region of DNA, and here we have known gene models. So for this one region of DNA, we have multiple combinations of transcripts that may be invoked in this region. So we, here we have exon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Almost all of these include 
exon 1, but not all of them. All of them include exon 2. Only three of the four include exon 3. Exon 4 is only in half of them. Exon 5 appears in the first three, and the final exon appears in all of them. All right, so one gene, uh, one gene relates to four gene models that represent different transcripts, different exon uh, graphs through there. And now, we're going to produce sequence from that. When we produce sequences out of this, uh, it may be that we get uh, a read that spans from one exon to the next. You see, this, this has a long bar in the middle of it. That's to reflect that an intron gets spliced out, and this single read can split across two exons. Would this read have resulted from gene model two or, or three? No, because in gene models two or three, exon two, sorry, this, this exon here, number four, I guess it was, doesn't appear. So these, these reads can then be used to determine with a pretty high specificity which exon-exon boundaries are observed in transcripts. And that can give you some hint as to which complete transcripts are being produced in the ratios. Now, there are some limitations to this. If you see a read like this top one, you know it comes from this gene model because this gene model is the only one that has a, a, a direct connection between those two exons. The others have something in between. But a lot of times, there will be multiple transcripts through a gene that, uh, that, that, inc that incorporate this exon-exon boundary. So you, if you have a, an advanced level of knowledge about a gene, RNA-seq can give you some very finely detailed information about which exon boundaries are observed. That's quite valuable. All right, now what happens if you have a gene sequence, but you're not really sure which exons are real and which exons get spliced together? In a case like that, RNA-seq is your best friend because RNA-seq is gonna give you all of this tag information, all these reads and contexts from this that help you to, to apprise um, whether something is or is not expressed. Right? If, if the exon never, if the uh, putative exon never appears in RNA seq based on messenger RNAs, you've got no reason to think that that putative exon um, really is expressed. So that's quite valuable. Um, you're also going to get exon exon boundaries that allow you to stitch together what possible transcripts may result um, out of this mess. So very powerful. But let's consider the even odder case. Let us say that you're working in something for which we don't have a sequence. Now, having, uh, having just said otter, I immediately think, what about sea otters? Do we have an annotated genome for sea otters? I don't actually know. I'm going to throw another example at you. The hyena, crocuta crocuta. My, my group is doing research on hyena because we think it's really wild and cool. Um, we think that uh, we can learn something about its transcriptome even though we don't have a genome and, and there is no annotation for Procuta Procuta. So we have all of the sequence data that we've generated from messenger RNAs, and that's enough for us to do de novo assembly to pull transcripts out, even though we don't have a genome sequence to align it to. That is not a trick you can do with a microarray. We wouldn't know what to put on the microarray. But because we're able to sequence the messenger RNAs in little patches, we're able to reassemble whole transcripts out of it. Very powerful. Okay, so we see then that there are some things for which we could use a microarray very happily, but for some of the most uh, for some of the most in-depth knowledge, most sensitive knowledge about the transcriptome, RNA seq typically has won. Now uh, I, I want you to sort of flip this in reverse from the previous slide. Uh, because instead of having our uh, highly annotated uh, genome on the right, we have it on the left. So I'm going to skew to the left on this side. In genome mapping, we have a known annotated genome. When we gather reads, we're going to map those, uh, we could map those to the genome. And that, that's quite powerful. 
if you've got if you're doing your mapping to gene models, you're probably doing your mapping to the set of messenger RNAs known for that species. So in both of these cases, we're using the annotation. In this case, we're mapping to the genome. In that case, we're mapping to the transcriptome, which yields different kinds of information. You can see that we've got several tools in here. One that I would uh, make sure you know about, we, we started talking about yesterday. Do you remember Bowtie? The burroughs Wheelers mapping algorithm? Yeah. Bowtie is part of uh, this, this uh, tuxedo set, really. So Bowtie shows up here as an ungapped mapper. Remember that if you're aligning reads from, uh, from messenger RNA to transcript sequences, you don't need to worry about uh, the, the, the intron sequences. They're, they've already been spliced out. So Bowtie can do ungapped mapping of reads from RNA-seq to the transcript sequences themselves. Over here, though, we may be using something like Top Hat to do mapping against genome. And this is tricky because a read drawn from messenger RNA may need to be split across exon boundaries to make it align properly. This part aligns to this exon. This part aligns to this other exon. That's what creates those gap structures that we saw in the previous image. Now, over here, uh, You'll, you'll know that familiar phrase, the, the De Bruyne graphs. De Bruyne, sorry, I, I mispronounced it for this area. Um, so, Trinity is a really popular software package for doing de novo assembly from RNA sequences. This is what we've been using in, in the case of uh, Hyena, because we have really no gene models whatsoever to work with. We just have RNA seq, and we're making our best guess of what transcripts explain the data we've seen. So we're stitching together lots and lots of reads to try to get an end-to-end -end representation of all the major transcripts available from that species. So these are mapping exercises. We talked about mapping versus assembly yesterday. This is an assembly exercise. They're going to give us different kinds of information. So I thought it was valuable to show not just kind of the overall scheme of what we were trying to accomplish, but also the kinds of software that we would use to accomplish those. Okay, that brings us to data analysis, which is to say, a break. Okay, uh, to continue with data analysis, lots of things we can do right, lots of things we can do wrongly, as we try to work our way from the data set to a final answer. So, we, we start with this notion that fluorescent probe intensity in the context of microarrays and bees is going to give us some guide to the number, of, to the quantity of messenger RNA for a particular gene. We, we argue that the more probes, uh, the, the, the more of our sample DNA that's hybridized to the probes on our microarray, the brighter the fluorescence. That's great. And yet, uh, we, we see that these dim spots, those that produce the least light, are frequently um, associated with the highest degree of error. That our ability to, uh, to, to say, what would, if, if you just use the same sample on microarray after microarray, and you looked at the variance of bright spots versus the variance of dim spots, you would find that the the uh, sample to sample con uh, inconsistency would be much worse for low signals than for high. And this, this is actually a very common phenomenon in all kinds of analytical chemistry, but it's something to, to think about. Generally speaking, if you are looking at microarrays to find candidate genes associated with some condition, um, would you anticipate that the brightest spot on the microarray is the one that's most likely to be an interesting biological molecule for you? I mean, is actin and myosin and stuff like that, is that the most important one, the mo one that's most likely to get you a paper in science? It's not. So generally speaking, we're very interested in genes that are minority players in terms of how much messenger RNA they produce when we're going after biomarkers for some disease. Which means that our interest actually falls in the low expression area of the microarray. So this is a bad combination. We're most interested in genes that haven't been really well characterized so far. And yet, the genes that have low signals in, mi in microarrays tend to be those with the highest variance 
this puts a really heavy emphasis on ways to deal with this variability at the low end of expression. One of the approaches that uh, was very strongly used for a long time uh, was the robust multi-array analysis. One of the concepts that uh, I, I would note is that we need to be able to deal with a, with a lot of dynamic range in a microarray experiment. Right? That the brightest spot is going to be many orders of magnitude more light than the, than the dimmest spot. Right? So one of the ways that we deal with that in bioinformatics is to deal with log intensity rather than intensity itself. So when we, when we use these log intensities, we probably want to have some way to adjust for uh, the, the variation that we see. And RMA gives us the ability to look across arrays and evaluate this variability properly. So a combination of expression of probe affinity and measurement error. So let's talk about those. We already mentioned expression, uh, that the, the low signals tend to be the stuff that's most biologically interesting. Probe affinity might not be something that's inherently obvious, so I'll, I'll just point this out. We use probe sequences that are designed to match to certain exons or to certain transcripts with high affinity. And yet, if I have 10,000 copies of this transcript and 10,000 copies of that transcript, the brightness levels that I see for the corresponding spots may differ substantially. This is because the affinity that we use, uh, the, the affinity of the probe sequences that we select may actually be quite different between the two. If you have one that's you know, all GC and makes really strong hybridization, it might be more efficient at capturing the corresponding molecule out of solution than one that has a relatively high AT level, for example. So the probe affinity is going to figure into how much brightness we get. Measurement error is the thing that's going to get really pounded on today, so I'm not going to hit it a lot right here. But I would just point out that if you try to pipe that the same amount of cDNA from 15 samples on the 15 microarrays, you're likely to have a little bit of variation in exactly how much you squeeze into each, into each microarray. I mean, it could just be that I'm a lousy pipetter, but the reality is lots of us, I think, have slight differences in how much we, we uh, actually apply to each sample. I don't think I'm alone in that one. Okay. So, when we deal with microarrays, we're dealing with a pattern of light intensity. But typically with RNA-seq, we need to have some way to translate the count of how many reads map to this gene into some sort of abundance factor. Very frequently, that is an RPKM measurement, and it's worthwhile to talk about how we get there. So we start that we have some number of sequencing reads that have been mapped to a particular transcript. It might be that we're doing a per exon count, or we might be doing a per gene count. You see why those would be very different, right? If you, if you count how many, um, how many reads map to the entire gene, uh, gene structure, you're going to have a much broader number of counts to work from than simply how many land on this particular exon, or bridge it to another exon. Okay, so we have some number of reads that we've aligned that match to this, uh, to this gene. We have the length of that gene, maybe 2,000 nucleotides is pretty common for uh, a, a gene length here. Now, is that a full gene or is that the, the messenger RNA? Uh, a, a full gene is, is typically massive. Right, once you include introns and everything, it's a massive structure, maybe, maybe even a megabase of, of genomic DNA. So typically for gene length, if you're, if you're sequencing from messenger RNA, you, you, would, uh, you would determine that compared to the transcript length, the messenger RNA transcript length, not the full gene, uh, not the full gene size, okay? So we have, uh, and why, why, would, why do we need to include gene length in our map here, because a very small gene is likely to produce fewer reads than a very large gene. Right? If you look at, say, the, the Titan transcript and compare that to the insulin transcript, you, you don't expect, uh, if, if they were genes of similar expression, that you're going to have the same number of reads on each. So we take the gene length into account as a way to, uh, to normalize 
for the, the size of the target we're hitting. And then the total number of reads. So here we ask how many reads from this entire RNA seq experiment mapped to any transcript at all. Now I would note that this number is not always 100%. Right? If you, if you do an RNA seq experiment and go mapping back to transcripts, some of the messenger RNA that you sequenced, some of it isn't human, right? You may, you may have something other than human in your sample in addition, uh, maybe a little bit of microbiome alongside. Um, you may have viruses. Uh, you may have um, some sequence variants that, that block you from getting a, a proper mapping. So, there are, uh, so we, we ask what's the total number of reads that are mapped, not the total number of reads produced. That's the difference. Okay, so now our number of reads um, is going to be divided by the gene length divided by 1,000 times the total number of reads divided by 1 million. Everyone counted the zeros that way, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1 million. And from that comes the RPKM value. So reads per kilobase of exon model per million reads. It's, it's, it's much easier to just say RPKM. It's quite related to another measurement that we sometimes see in genomics called FPKM, fragments per kilobase of exon model per million reads. Okay, so RPKM is, a, is a, a pretty typical way for us to express for a given gene how, how uh, it is rate of, of read accumulation. Now normalization is one of the ways that we can deal with this problem of, of Dave's twitchy uh, pipetter finger. Right? If, if I have 10% more sample squeezed onto this microarray than onto this one, then I expect 10% more brightness from all the spots on that microarray. Or 10% or, or more RPKM for particular transcripts. The power is going to come right back real soon now. Okay, so let's imagine then that I've sprayed, uh, I've squirted just a little bit more out of my pipetter for this microarray than for that one. One of the things that should, uh, does that mean that the load shedding is over now? Oh, and we're just waiting for the normal pattern for that one. It's coming back up. Okay, so if I were to plot how much expression I had for each gene <laughs> in microarray one versus microarray two, if they were, if it's the same sample in both cases, I would probably expect all the data to fall along the diagonal. Why is that? They're the same sample, so that means that the, the measurement for this gene in the first replicate and the measurement for that gene in the second replicate should be the same, plus or minus some error. Right. So that would give us a diagonal that's, uh, that's very well aligned with dots. Things close to the origin would represent uh, uh, genes that were at low concentration in both samples. Things far from the origin would represent genes that were way up in both. So normalization reflects one of the ways that we try to adjust data back to that diagonal, so to speak. So without normalization, I can look across all the different genes that I've measured in each of eight microarrays. Does everyone know how to read a box plot? Do it pretty well. I, I see a, a, a scratch diagram, so I'm going to take a moment with this. This box plot shows us the distribution of log intensities across all of the microarrays points. The median value is the median intensity on the log scale that we saw for any gene. And that little line across the box shows us that. This is typically the 25th percentile. It's the uh, the element that sits halfway between the median and the, and the lowest value. This is the 75th percentile, marking the halfway point between the median and the highest value. And then we've got some values way up high and some way down low. All right. So without normalization, we might conclude that something like uh, sample 7 probably had a little bit more sample added to it than did the others. That's, that's one possible uh, reason for why its distribution is all shifted upward. Um, it might be that sample 5 had a little bit less sample uh, added to it than the others, which is why its, its whole box slides a little bit lower. So we want to have some sort of normalization method that puts them on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. Okay, 
So global normalization is an approach that people really, really frequently use. Uh, and here you can see that uh, we've looked for some mean, median value, uh, some, some mean value to work with. And now we've adjusted all of these. We've multiplied all of those gene expression values for that plate by some multiplier that forces these median values to be identical across the board. Okay, so global normalization is, is just multiplying each, or, each entire array by a constant. Sometimes we... we How do you determine the constant? How do you determine the constant? Oh, sure, okay. So um, I can, for example, uh, ask each array what was your median value, and out pops that number. Then I say, what's the average of those values? That average is now 1.0. And so everything is just going to get scaled uh, with respect to that. Um, in this case, yeah, we've said we need to make the median the same. You could also make the mean the same. Uh, the, the same approach is not that important. Sometimes, however, we would like to, we would like greater uniformity out of our data than that. So in this case, we only force the medians to be at the same level. We might instead want to see that the data follow the same distribution in each case. So an approach called quantile normalization gives us that. And it's going to really manipulate the data so that they uh, have the same 25th percentile and the same 75th percentile and the same median. Now, somebody who's just looking at this at a glance might say, well, goodness, aren't you taking all the information out of that array and throwing it away? Aren't you forcing all genes to have the same intensity values? But that's not what we're doing. We're not requiring that, this, that each gene in each of these microarrays has the same value. We're saying that the distribution will be the same. So individual genes will differ. Maybe um, actin falls here on, gene, on array one, but up here on, gene, uh, on array two, or here on array three. Actin is not compelled to be ranked the same within those distributions, but the distribution shape will be the same. Now, there are limits to what you can do with this. Imagine that you have a microarray that, uh, that doesn't have a wide distribution of, of intensity values, but rather has a maximum value about here, and a minimum value here in a box that's really constrict, uh, con, uh, constricted uh, much, much more uh, compactly. That would be a really bad thing to try to normalize into quantile normalization. It probably suggests that that array is a quality fail, that you need to just say, this data set's distribution is such an outlier that I can't take its data seriously. So trying to just normalize away problems like that is a, is a dangerous trait to, to adopt. So which one would be the best, the global or the global Which is best, global or quantile? I, it's really going to depend on the scenario. It, imagine that you had 10 cancers versus 10 normals, for example. And then you said, well, I feel like these data aren't very comparable between these two very different physiologic conditions. So I'm going to do quantile normalization on the whole set. But what if, what if the cancer set really has a different distribution overall than does the healthy set? That, that's not going to make any sense. And you, so you, you would throw away a lot of information in your set to force them all to the same distribution. So I, I think that quantile normalization is fine for, uh, for experiments where your cohorts are very similar in overall distribution. But torturing the data to stretch them to the distribution that the, that the other cohort is, that'd be bad. So something like global normalization is very widely used, um, but it's, it's always a good idea to keep in mind how those extreme values can behave under the circumstances. You ask a tough question there, actually. And I, I feel like that's, a, that's one that a lot of stat statisticians could answer more effectively, I think. All right. Next, I would like to talk about bias and magnitude. Bias and magnitude. So Land and Altman put together a plot called the MA plot. This is very, very standard fare. If you are reading a paper about microarrays, seeing a Land Altman plot is very, very likely. So I, I thought it would be useful for you to understand how to interpret them. We want to evaluate whether at different magnitudes of signal, we have a bias in, in toward one plate or toward another. 
So here we're going to imagine a comparison between just two microarrays. In the old days, these would have been done with a two-color uh, microarray, like a red-green plot. Uh, so one microarray has a red signal for one condition and a green signal for the other, and we want to uh, evaluate whether there's a bias toward red or green. These days, we do a lot of single-color uh, microarrays that we buy a, a batch of 50 microarrays, 25 we, uh, we give to one cohort, 25 we give to the other, and then we want to compare between pairs of microarray experiments to ask about bias in one direction or the other. Okay, so M is the log difference in signal between uh, uh, what we saw for a given gene. Now, we mentioned a moment ago that we were doing log intensity values just to help smash out some of the really high dynamic range of these microarrays. Now I'm talking about a difference in log values. So why, why is a log difference in value a meaningful number? What's one of the, the most powerful um, numbers that you get for a given gene in a microarray? Has everyone seen full change? Full change. So if, you've, if you're looking at gene expression for actin or for any other gene you want, uh, you can ask, how many times more do I find of this gene in one sample than in the other? Okay, so you are biologists. I now ask you, if I tell you that I'm quite sure this gene is present at 10% higher level in people with diabetes than without, what do you say? 10% change. Is that a big deal? You're going to get a nature paper out of that? No nature paper. Why not? not that What's that? It's not that high. Not that high. <laughs> All right. So, there's, there's a contrast here between how biologists feel about this and how statisticians feel about this. I may be able to prove very, very confidently that people with diabetes always have a 10% higher level for some particular gene expression. And as a statistician, you're probably going to feel really good about that. I've got a p-value that looks like blah, 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 blah. This is amazing. It always holds up. But you as a biologist are going to look at that and say, oh, um. Right, so we have this interest then in full change. Many, many biologists looking at gene expression data assume that if something is not at least too full different um, in one cohort than in another, it's just biological noise. Okay, now that's not a statistical point of view, that is a biologist sort of thing. So if we are looking at intensities on log base two, how different do two things need to be in order to be a two-fold change up or down? Oh, you didn't know I bring in the math today, did you? <laughs> Sometimes math shows up. All right, I, I already told you part of the answer in my question. How different are two values on log base two if they are two-fold different in one direction or the other? answer is right there in the question. If it's log base 2, they are one unit apart if it's up or whether it's up or down, right? So if, if you have a value of 7.5 in this cohort and 8.5 in the other cohort and you're using log base 2, that means they're twofold different. If you have 7.5 and 6.5, they're minus one different. They're twofold apart. Okay, so when we do these log fold differences, we're basically asking, you know, what is the fold change? Zero on a log scale means they're one to one. They're the same concentration. So we expect most of the genes to fall along this horizontal line. Things that are upregulated are going to go up, and things that are downregulated are going to go down. If you're using log base two, being one uh, outside the plus one boundary or outside the minus one boundary means it's biologically significant. Okay, a statistician will shoot me when they see that on the video, and they'll be right. Okay, so that is our full change. What about this A axis? This is the average intensity for a given gene. So we have measured two different microarrays. We have the same gene appearing in both. We're going to sum those values together on the log scale, and then that's where that gene appears. So if you're looking at these genes way out here, this is stuff like actin and myosin that are just up at really, really huge levels. Ribosomal genes, that'll help us. 
maybe you have some stuff involved in like signal transduction down here, these really low levels. So we have the things that have a blast of signal at the right and things that have just a minute signal at the left. Now, one of the things that you probably notice is that there's a bunch more gunk down here than up here. Most of the biological stuff that we, that we can produce is produced at a low level. This is a well-behaved MA plot. Now, let's look at one where things have gone badly. All right. So at the left, we see the unadjusted intensity log pole change. And what do you notice about this, this uh, peak? Do, do we still have a nice alignment to the horizontal? We do not. We've got this big dip here. So in effect, what this curve that's been fitted to the MA plot is telling us is that it is typical at low abundance to have a two-fold change in the negative direction. That's typical. So that's a real problem for us because we're not if, if we're seeing microarray data that look like this, it's, it's telling us that it's bogus. It's always showing higher in this cohort than, at this, than this cohort as a function of intensity. That's not a typical result. Generally speaking, the statistical models we use for gene expression assume that most genes aren't meaningfully changing as a way to judge how um, <laughs> That, that you need this to be true in order uh, to be able to determine what's varying from this normal behavior of no change. So we have a normalization method that's been applied here to erase this error, to bring the data back to something more like what we expect it to look like. Are those bulletproof? No. If you have a really strong eyebrow effect on your, on your Land-Altman plot, it may be that, some, that one of those microarrays needs to be tossed. Sometimes that happens. Okay. Now let's talk about batch effects. To be in biomedical research means to have a certain amount of faith that the instruments we work with give us the same results day after day after day. But have you, have you noticed that some instrumentation has personality? Has anyone here never kicked an instrument? No one's saying anything. <laughs> All right, well, I would just say that generally people have said some very negative things about equipment over time, and happily the equipment doesn't seem to be the worst off for it. But some instruments are downright twitchy. If you were to run an experiment at a proteomics facility today, and run that same experiment on the same sample 30 days from now, are you going to get the same result? No. no. She's, she's got a very quick answer on that one. I had that. <laughs> yes. If you run the same sample through a sequencer today and run it through that same sequencer a month from now, do you get the same effect, the same result? You do not. Microarrays are no different than this. So we have this problem that if you were to run all of the cases today and all of the controls next week, well, you deserve to be dropped out of grad school. <laughs> that is a batch effect. That is a very bad thing, and it will throw off your result permanently. And no amount of massaging the data, no expert biostatistician is going to save your bacon. OK? So um, instrument performance varies with time. It's true whether you're doing sequencing or anything else. Data acquired on samples in week one will generally differ from data acquired on the same samples in week two. Sometimes we are compelled to run our data in different batches on an instrument. Maybe the mass spec can only squeeze you in this week and four weeks from now, and that's just how it's going to be. So first off, it's really valuable if you are able to randomly distribute samples from both cohorts throughout both batches. That way, you're not confounding the batch effect with cohort effect. You're not able to learn anything about biological effect if you confound those two. It is very important as well that your statistical model know that some of these data were collected in the first batch and some were collected in the second batch. You may need an expert statistician to do that. It's valuable for you to be able to evaluate batch effect magnitude by running the same sample in every batch. 
If you have a few that have been run in every batch, it gives you some abilities to subtract away the instrument variability from batch effect. Again, you'll probably need a really good statistician, and they're not easy to find, which is one reason why I'm teaching you this stuff, because I hope that you guys can become expert statisticians and I can include you on my grants. Okay? So learn fast. All right. Now, you will know that if Keith Baggerly writes correspondence to a journal about your paper, you are in big, big trouble. Baggerly is uh, a forensic biostatistician in a lot of respects. He is very, very good at figuring out what went wrong with data and at puncturing the balloons of people who make claims from their data that their data cannot support. So I love this quote. They ran all the controls on one day and all the cancers on the next day, Dr. Baggerly said. This is the worst kind of design when you are using a machine that can be subject to external factors, such as changes in calibration or mechanical breakdown. Biomedical research has a few people who are not afraid of telling the truth. And if they're examining your paper and finding that kind of result, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt a lot. There are lots and lots of things that we use for analyzing the data sets we produce. In, in gene expression, differential expression is a really common outcome. Clustering is as well. Classification is as well. We're not going to talk about this one as much. Frequently, we talk about subjects like machine learning in the area of biomarker research. I'm happy to talk with you about that at some point, but uh, it's not on the roster today because it's kind of a complex topic. So let's look at these three major analysis types. We're going to have uh, some greater discussion on class comparison, what genes differentiate the controls from the cases, and from class detection to say which samples are similar, which genes show similar patterns. So we're going to start with a little discussion of clustering, and then we're going to move into comparing gene expression. <clears throat> oh, as I mentioned, the, the biomarker problem, which genes are most useful in predicting whether someone is sick or not, uh, we're not really going to get into today. So clustering is a really frequently used tool set, but I think that a lot of people don't really understand how it works. Uh, so I wanted to, to give us a, uh, a take on this. You've run a whole bunch of samples. Maybe you had 90 people that all had colon cancer. And you want to understand whether some of these colon cancer cases were more similar to each other than they were to the others, right? You, you've seen this in breast cancer, right? In, in breast cancer, we see that triple negatives are a different class in a lot of respects than people who have functional receptors um, from, the, from the set of three, right? So in, in some respects, what type of breast cancer a person has determines what kind of treatment they need to get, right? So in the same way, it might be that you could look as a discovery question at a collection of people who are apparently sick with the same disease and ask whether their gene profiles, their expression levels, really are similar or not. This is an, an unbiased discovery process. Okay, so the, this data, data mining technique is going to join together which of the samples are most similar and maybe on the other axis act, uh, ask which genes show the most similar behavior across samples. You can do this in both dimensions. So when we talk about bi-clustering, we're using both those dimensions at the same time. So what we're going to create is a hierarchy. I've drawn a little uh, hierarchy up there at the top left. Do you see it? So we have samples A, B, C, D, E, and F. This hierarchy suggests that E was most similar to F. Why do I reach that conclusion? Okay. You can see that this hook right here, this, this branch that leads to E and F, is closest to the ground. So when I read this graph, it tells me that E and F were most similar out of all the samples. The next most similar pair was A and B. Then, the intersection of D with this pair is the next best. So I can just keep working my way up higher and higher in that graph to discover the, the pairs that have been inferred out of these, that have been clustered out of them. Okay, that's called a dendrogram up there. So we need to have some sort of distance metric, a distance metric. So for 
that given samples A and B, I need to be able to put a number on how close together they are. This might be something like a Euclidean distance. So if I have um, a whole bunch of gene data, I might do PCA. Everyone heard of PCA? Okay, I'm not going to explain how to do PCA today. Again, kind of complex. Um, but it is a, a way to combine together data from lots and lots of genes into components to allow us to say which are most similar in principal component space. Okay, so a distance metric might use something like PCA to say which of these samples are closest together. Then, I'm either going to use an agglomerative approach or a divisive group. Everybody should say the word agglomerative at least once. Agglomerative. Is that not beautiful? Oh. Okay, so what, how do agglomerative and divisive approaches work? Agglomerative means we're going to look for the things that are uh, most similar and stick those together. It's, it's like gluing together the items that are most similar until you get to the top. So it's basically working from the bottom of that hierarchy up there to the top. A divisive approach is quite different. So you might use something like k-means uh, as, as an approach to uh, separate out these data and say, if I lay a line here and call these group 1 and these group 2, I can then look inside group 1 and say, well, if I put a line here, I'm going to call those group 1a and group 1b. Right? So I'm starting with a big pool and I keep laying lines across it until I've got it separated to individual uh, items. That's a divisive approach. Both of these are legit. They depend slightly on when you would want to use one or the other. Generally speaking, your output is then a dendogram like we have at the upper left. So if you look at A, B, C, D, E, and F, how many different groups are there? Three. She says three. She says six. This is the magic of dendrograms. Different people can look at them and come away with very different conclusions about how many branches are necessary to explain them. In other words, I can look at a dendrogram of 90 cancer patients and say, well, they clearly fall into three groups. And you would look at the same one and come away with the impression that there are five. For this, we frequently find that people need to uh, evaluate kind of the, the, the metrics of closeness within and outside those groups. And there are some statistical methods that allow us to lay the line across here and say, well, four is really the proper way to set this, or two is the proper way to set this. But as always, uh, I mean, if, if, if you must be a purist about it, you can always say that each sample is only itself. <laughs> but generally speaking, biologists like to be able to lump these things together in a way. All right. Now, I mentioned, I, I was talking about clustering in the sense of which samples are most similar to each other. By clustering is allowing us to do this in two directions at once. So I think many people have seen these, uh, these red-green plots uh, where we, I have to say, red and green was like the worst possible color combination for microarray plots ever, because lots of dudes cannot tell these colors apart based on our lousy eyes. Well, so sometimes you'll see them in red and green. This is the most canonical uh, uh, depiction of them. But a lot of people use blue-yellow plots, and those are also pretty good, except, again, for guys who've got bad eyes on, on that color scheme. So, say hello you. So, up at the top, I have different cell lines. So here we're, we're looking at a bunch of different cancer cell lines and asking which, uh, which drugs are they susceptible to, etc. So different cell lines across the top, and now I have genes down the side. Now this shows a set of, a set of like I'd say, a thousand different genes. We measured more than that. But you see in this case, we had a lot of genes that were very constant across all the different samples. So we've, we've limited ourselves to just those genes that have variance across samples. This gives us the ability to limit the number of genes that we're going to examine. So now we can cluster together those genes that show the, the, the greatest similarity of expression across cell lines. And we can group together cell lines that show the greatest degree of similarity across genes. We do this simultaneously in both directions. And that produces this checkerboard. So when we look at this checkerboard, we can say, well, these are the ups, these are the downs. Um, the cells, uh, these cells separate into two very different blocks based on this clustering uh, approach. 
That is a little hard to do by hand. Um, we have many, many genes, we have many, many cells that we want to compare. So in, in effect, people have, have created some really cool software toolkits to assist us in this. Uh, I've, I've listed just four uh, that, that we can find, the Cubic CPB, the Plaid model, BBC. Uh, all, this is a list from 2012, I'm sure. There have been five new methods published in 2019 that, 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 that can aid us here. But um, software like this is, is frequently available within, our, within the Bioconductor Toolkit uh, for assisting you in doing this kind of grouping. So you don't, have to, you don't have to do it all yourself. You can rely on the software to do it for you. So let's now uh, move away from clustering and consider the question of how we determine which genes are different between a pair of cohorts. All right, so we have cases and controls, or we have people who were on placebo and or people who were um, receiving a drug, right? We have uh, lots of different possible categorizations, but they're just cohorts. So um, we have a, a table like this uh, that is so, so very common in all kinds of, of biomarker searches. We have a set of genes. These are different probe names uh, given over at the left. And then we have samples across the columns. And a number then uh, appears in each case, in each column. So these numbers reflect our normalized abundance for this particular gene for this particular sample. Here we were comparing uh, uh, the amount of uh, HNA, uh, hydroxynonimol, <laughs> that each of these samples was exposed to. As I said, the, the particular rationale for the cohort doesn't really enter into it so much. So for this particular gene, or in this case a particular probe on the microarray, I want to ask, are the numbers that we see in the control cohort from the same distribution as those from the case cohort? So I'm going to pull out a row out of this table to ask that question. So it might seem that I ask that question a little oddly. Why, why, would I, uh, why would I ask the question, are the values from the cases from the same distribution as from the controls? I mean, as a graduate student, you want to publish and you want to get out, right? You want to complete a degree at some point? She does. She wants to. That's good. That's good. Right. So why am I asking the question in such a negative way to say that do these numbers all come from the same distribution? because that's the way that the expression works in the frequentist approach quite typically. When the, the, kind of, the kind of statistical test that we use in this case is generally built around that hypothesis. Do all of these numbers come from the same distribution? So that is what we call a null hypothesis, an H sub zero. And I think many of you right at this point, I, I just saw a shutter come down in, in front of your eyes saying, oh my goodness, he's going to do statistics class all over again. It's a really important concept, so we're, we're going to try to, to, to bear with it. The null hypothesis that's common to things like t-test says we're hypothesizing that all of these numbers come from the same distribution. Prove me wrong, right? To use the mean. All right, so under this assumption, we would ask how probable it is that we would develop a higher or lower test statistic by random chance alone. Now, Gossett is, well, he's kind of a hero. I mean, among the, among the people in biostatistics, he was probably one of the, uh, <laughs> the, the least awful. <laughs> I, I taught a statistics course a few years back about the origin of biostatistics, and I included some historical profiling on people who contributed all these amazing methods in biostatistics. And I got to tell you, the eugenics runs strong with that group. <laughs> There are some really vile people behind the origins of Biostat. <laughs> I think my favorite quote was the one from the guy who said, uh, if the poor are going to continue spamming the world with their get, we might as well get some work from them in the factories. <laughs> I was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> Biostatistics, everybody. OK, well, anyway. You should read about it. It's, it's a very interesting, it's, it's like a very strongly linked event diagram. All right. So, gossip. We don't dislike Gossett as strongly. Why is that? What was Gossett trying to do with his statistics? Is equal or is 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, what was the application area for him? What was it proving that the, the poor of the world are outbreeding the, 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 the good people of Earth? No. Gossip was working at. Oh, I'm so sad people don't know the story. The Guinness Brewery. <laughs> he was trying to make beer. <laughs> okay, well, so Gossett uh, was working for a, 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 a brewery. Uh, and unlike wine, where you want each year to have its distinctive notes of oak and whatever. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have to laugh at you know, I just. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, the beer people wanted to do it the same way every time to have consistency in what the batches would taste like. And that's perfect for a statistician. But when he was working with them, he, they said, we're not going to let you publish in your own name. And the reason was that they didn't want the other breweries to catch on that they had a statistician. So they made him publish under a pseudonym. Does anyone know the name he chose? Student. Student's tea test was made by a guy working in the brewery. All right. One more reason it's your favorite test, right? All right. When we do difference testing, hey, I just got to say that's a lot better than <laughs> to single one person out, R.A. Fisher. We think of R.A. Fisher as like a god on Olympus, right? His first position in the faculty was the chair of the eugenics department. Smack, smack. Ah, awful people. All right, so today's biostatisticians I like a lot better, I just have to say. Okay, so we talk then about determining whether these levels are different or not. We would like to uh, make sure that everyone knows these two terms that come along with it. Not all t-tests are alike, right? I'm not even talking about variance estimation here. But for, for a given t-test, you should know whether or not your scenario calls for a paired t-test. So imagine that you took a blood sample from me today, and you took another blood sample from me in a month after I've been on, uh, after I've joined CrossFit, right? So, right. so uh, after a month of CrossFit, do I have different gene measurements than I did before? That's a paired example because the sample for me from before can only be compared to the sample from me after. You don't have two cohorts there, you have two different time points. So using a paired t-test is, is appropriate when this particular result from the A cohort corresponds to this particular result from the B cohort. Okay, you should always use the paired t-test when that applies, and you should never use it when it doesn't apply. Next up, one-sided or two-sided. I'm going to use the example of dieting here. So let us imagine that we have invented magical compound C that if given to professors will make them lose their swivel chair spread. Right? So now I have a, I have a, 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 a measurement uh, at time point A and a measurement at time point B after I've been on compound C. And we want to ask, has my weight dropped or not? Did you notice it changed, right? We don't care about if my weight goes up, because I might have been sneaking jelly beans on the side. You know me, I did just eat two jelly beans, two, two donuts in front of you, right? So in the case of a one-sided t-test, you're asking, uh, are these values lower only, right? or are these values higher only? But you have to make a choice about it. In the case of our compound C diet plan, we're only caring about whether they dropped or not. That is a one-sided hypothesis. A two-sided hypothesis just asks, are they different or not, right? So these, uh, it, knowing when to use a one-sided versus two-sided test can be a very big deal. If you use a two-sided test when you should be using a one-sided test, you are half as sensitive to real differences, right? So you should know these things. Anytime you use a t-test, Ask yourself the question, should these be paired, should this be one-sided or two? Okay. Now, out of this, we very, very frequently see in our uh, gene expression experiments a volcano plot. After today, you, you, and you shall be experts in how to read volcano plots. And when you see this in a journal club, and the person is hemming and hawing and saying, 
well, they use this one plot. I don't know what it means. Let's move on. You can say, stop. I shall read it for you. This is the kind of excellence that you're going to bring. So these individual spots represent genes. OK? Different genes, different spots. On the x-axis, we have a log base 2 fold change. We saw those just a moment ago, right? When you were looking at the bland altman plot, in that case it was higher or lower, depending on what its fold change was. Here it's left or right. This is a log base 2 fold change, which means that if you're at minus 1, you're twofold down, and if you're at positive 1, you're twofold up. See, if you do this on a linear scale, it would all get smashed to one side. So in a log base 2 fold change, you can imagine that our biological significance line, and I'm going to put double quotes around that every time I say it, is going to extend upwards from this 1 and upwards from this minus 1. Anything inside those lines, anything sitting in that in inner region, we're going to say, this didn't change enough for biologists to care about it. OK? So we've already just separated this into three zones. Stuff below minus 1, stuff above plus 1, and stuff in between. Stuff in between, we just summarily ignore. Next, we care about things that have very low p values. All right, so that is going to be represented on the negative log base 10 scale. This should remind you of something we talked about yesterday. Do you remember when we talked about Fred scores? Right, so a Fred score of 30 is a 1 in 1,000. Uh, a chance of error a score of 20 is a 1 in 100 chance of failure. So here we're showing p values in exactly the same way. Negative, a negative, time, a negative 1 times the log base 10 of that number. So if you can imagine this as a horizontal line drawn across here. Anything above that line has a very low p value. Anything below that line has, doesn't reach statistical significance. Okay, so we started by separating into three zones horizontally. We've continued by separating into two zones horizontally. So you can think of this as six zones. One, two, three, four, five, six. Nothing on the bottom matters, ignore that. Nothing in the middle matters, ignore that middle one. These genes are down and significant. These genes are up and significant. Ta-da! That's it. That's the volcano plot. I hope that helps. All right. Because you will definitely see these in almost any differential expression paper. Oh, yes. Ah. How is the, what is the value of a Bland-Altman plot versus the value of a volcano plot? Bland-Altman is for comparing the, the bulk signals from two microarrays to determine if there's a bias in response to abundance. A volcano plot is used for cohort versus cohort comparison. So we are, we are comparing not one microarray to one microarray, but the cohort of cases to the cohort of controls. So this is not a simple one microarray versus one microarray plot. So it's one control and one Sorry? Right, yes, yeah. So we're comparing the case cohort to the control cohort, and that data is summarized in the, the volcano plot. Good questions. Okay, let's continue on. This is a topic that is so near and dear to me, I can hardly express it. And the number of times I've had a conversation with a graduate student asking me why. Uh, why couldn't they just ignore multiple testing cor uh, correction just this once is a very large number. So I'm, I'm going to give the lecture. Uh, we're going we're to just embrace it, and everyone's going to be totally convinced that forever after, if they're testing multiple hypotheses, they are going to use multiple testing correction, and we're all going to be much happier for it. So let us imagine that we are once again looking at our case and control cohort. I have each of these different rows and I'm computing a p-value for each and every one of them. Is this gene distributed the same between those two cohorts? That's a t-test. Is this gene differential between these two cohorts? That's a t-test. Is this gene differential between these two cohorts? That's a t-test. 
right? How many genes may I be measuring on this RNA-seq experiment? 10,000? A lot. A lot of them. So doing t-test after t-test after t-test is a dangerous thing to do because you have a very good chance of getting a significant p-value just because you did a lot of tests. We have some answers for how to do that. So, um, typically we say that a t-test yields a p-value below 0.05 for 1 in 20 tests when no difference exists. Think about that. Now there was a really good cartoon on XKCD many years ago in which uh, a, a, a person came to the lab shouting, jelly beans cause cancer. Uh, and, and so the scientists, being rigorous people, decided that they would determine which color of jelly bean causes cancer. So they started with the red jelly beans. Do red jelly beans cause cancer? No significant p-value. Do green jelly beans cause cancer? No significant p-value. White jelly beans? No significant Black jelly beans. Everyone knows the black jelly beans are suspect, right? I love black jelly beans. They're my favorite. They don't cause cancer. What about the pink ones? Is anyone suspicious about the pink jelly beans? No, they don't cause cancer. Anyway, they keep going through color after color after color, and they hit the orange ones, and they get a significant p-value. Is the correct conclusion what the what the media would would do with that report? saying, orange jelly beans cause cancer by our paper. Learn why. That's not the correct thing to do. Because the more questions you ask your data, the greater the chance that you have uh, a, a significant value by random chance alone. If you do 20 tests, 20 t-tests, you expect one of them to be significant just because you've done 20 tests. P values in random data, where there's no real difference between cohorts, should be uniformly distributed. And they're uniformly distributed between 0 and 1, just like that uniform distribution value we were sampling yesterday. So 1 in 20 times, it should fall below 0.05, because 0.05 is 1 20th of the space up to 1. If you perform a thousand t-tests, and that's really common in microarray or RNA-seq analysis, you would expect that 50 of them will be significant even when there's no difference whatsoever. There are a couple major approaches that people use for adjusting these values. And they come from uh, the Bonferroni correction. Uh, uh, Bonferroni was uh, actually a a uh, mathematician many, many years ago who never really worked in statistics, uh, but a, a female biostatistician in the United States realized that his, uh, his math could be applied in this context. So it's, it's interesting that we, we know it by the name Bonferroni, but we've, uh, I, I need to look in my other, uh, my other slides about this to remember her name. <laughs> it, I, it, women have done so much in, in, in biostatistics as well, and we just kind of wash out their names so frequently. This is an example. So the Bonferroni correction, invented by a female biostatistician, uh, uses a, an approach of setting our rules much tighter <coughs> to account for the effect that we've done a lot of different tests. So in the scenario where you've run a, uh, you've run a, a t-test for each of a thousand genes, her answer would be take the 0.05 threshold you were going to use and divide it by a thousand. That's pretty sharp, huh? So 0.05 divided by 1,000 is a much, much lower value. Getting a t-test to give you a statistic that low is quite great by random chance. And I want to point out that the Bonferroni correction is attempting to protect you against errors in a very conservative way. It's trying to prevent you from making any false positives. Okay? Any false positives. That is a very conservative kind of correction. The one that gets used much more heavily in biology is a little harder to apply. It's called the Benjamin Cockburn false discovery rate uh, approach. So here, let us imagine that each of these little symbols represents a, um, a t-test that we've done in our gene set. Maybe we had a thousand of them. 
Uh, and we're sorting them now from the lowest p-value we got to the highest. So we have some, some curve that these are going to represent. What we use is a, a, a sliding threshold. We have a very low threshold for the first one, where we have, if we've done a thousand trials, one over a thousand times 0.05, that's its threshold. But then we loosen up a little bit. We have a slightly, uh, a slightly higher threshold we're allowed to use for the second uh, value, and a, an even higher one for the third, and so on. So you can see that this, rock, this red line appearing here is showing the, the p-value we consider acceptable as, uh, for calling a difference. And then this symbol is below it for the set of lines, uh, for the set of t-tests that are, are going to be called significant. Now, before, Bonferroni was trying to prevent us from making any errors. Any claims we made about, false, uh, about positives, we were trying to ensure that to a very high uh, degree, those were not chance findings. The Benjamin E. Hopper FDR approach is trying to control the error rate among our claims. So instead of making zero false claims, we're trying to control the rate of false claims to say that these 100 genes were found to be differential between our cohorts and we're willing to tolerate a 5% error rate in that set. Right, so these 100 genes are differential of, and, but five of them are probably bogus. It's a much weaker claim, but it has the benefit that a lot of our, bio, a lot of our experiments can, uh, can have some results from it. It's, it's pretty rare in, in microarrays to see many values at all that are, um, uh, that are able to pass a bond for any test. Now, I get a lot of feedback from students on multiple testing correction. And I want to walk through a couple of them, if you, if you don't mind. The first thing that I hear is that when I used multiple testing correction, all of my hits went away. So I can't use it. All right? Now, what's wrong with that? Maybe the null distribution was correct. Um, professors, I'm going to ask you to shut your ears for just a moment. Is that okay? Sometimes, your professor had a hypothesis about a difference between cohorts, and that hypothesis was wrong. Sometimes your professor believed that this pathway of genes should be differential between cohorts, and they, he or she was just wrong. Okay, so sometimes the null distribution was correct, and your professor has sent you on a wild goose chase. It doesn't in fact happen. Okay, that can stand in the way of your getting a good paper right now, but we are ethical, careful people. We are. We also want to graduate, but we are not, we are not going to put into the peer-reviewed literature, not even into a shady journal that really deserves worse, um, we are not going to put into the literature a false claim. Even if your PI says, well, darn it, that should have been different. We are ethical, careful people. We don't publish false in false claims. But why? Why why, why, why don't you publish false? Why, why, why wouldn't we publish a false claim? Yeah, because the, the journals will accept data you know, false. Journals will sometimes publish papers that are uh, that have really shady methodology in them. It is true. Um, and yet, think about the consequences if you starting your own lab read a paper that said this pathway is differential in this, in this critical disease, and you then spend all of your startup money chasing a false claim. What if you have your own grad students working on this problem, and you've entirely wasted the two years of their MSc funding, right? It's a really bad scenario. You wouldn't want a PI to do that to you. So, yeah, um, using multiple testing correction is appropriate whenever we test a bunch of hypotheses. If you're testing a thousand different genes for difference, you'd better be prepared to use multiple testing correction. Dr. X published a paper in which he, it's always a he down, uh, didn't use multiple testing correction. So why do I have to use it? <coughs> I, I'm going I'm to try to 
speak carefully here. Um, I, I've come from a lot of labs that had a lot of money, that had a lot of power, um, that were friends with the journal editors that we were sending our manuscripts to, and stuff like that. And I've just got to say that if you are coming from, to pick a university, Harvard, if you're, if you're publishing from Harvard, working in the lab of a national fellow and blah, 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 and you send a paper to a journal that is run by a former graduate student of your PI, your paper, your manuscript is going to be looked at with much more favorable and forgiving eyes than if you send it from a lab in the developing world. If your PI is new, if you don't have huge amounts of grant funding. In effect, if I'm a graduate student at Harvard working through the Buddy Network to get my paper published, I can get away with shady nonsense. But if you're working in a lab in a country that doesn't have as strong a scientific funding uh, portfolio, your paper is going to be looked at more harshly than one from a Cambridge or a Harvard or an MIT. This is, this is the way the world is. People assume that if you're coming, if your manuscript is coming from a rich lab, you're not doing anything shady, even though you may very well be doing so. I read papers, say, in the Nature Family Journals or in Science, and I'm just like, God, what were they thinking? Why didn't the peer reviewers, why would the peer reviewers let this crack through? If I want to read good science, I tend to go for specialist journals like Analytical Chemistry, Journal of Proteome Research, stuff like that. Because there, at least the science is described in enough met methodological detail that I can figure out what they did. This is not always true in big name journals. So, ignore Dr. X. A lot of what Dr. X is doing is probably fraud anyway. I'm sorry, that is very judgmental, but people publish bad statistics all the time. Don't be, don't be one of those people. Make the world a better place. I'm idealistic enough to feel that that's still possible. Now, sometimes multiple testing correction sneaks up on you. Imagine that the only statistical test you know anything about is t-test. You guys know about tests other than t-test, right? This doesn't play. But imagine that you only know about t-test. And you are working with apples, pears, bananas, grapefruit, and kumquats, right? Five different species, and you're measuring an amount of something. Glucose levels, whatever. Okay, so now I have these five different categories and I've got the same measurement for each of them. That doesn't sound like a context for multiple testing correction, does it? But I'm only measuring one thing out of these five species. But now I want to compare our apples and pears the, from the same distribution or different. Our apples and oranges, our apples and kumquats, our apples and what was the other one? Bananas. Apples and bananas. So that's already four comparisons, apples against each of the other fingers, right? Then I say, what about pears? Pears compared to uh, kumquats, pears compared to bananas, pears compared to oranges. OK, well now, what about kumquats versus bananas, kumquats versus, that's a really fun word to say. Anyway, so look what happened. We were measuring just one thing for these five species. But because we're t-testing in this kind of clumsy way, this is really a better place for ANOVA. Um, we now have this problem. Our comparisons among five fruits has led to ten comparisons. There is a pretty good probability now that our significant result that came from one of those comparisons is just a false positive. It's like a coin flip that you get a, a false positive from that scenario. So don't let it creep up on you. Just do the right statistical test in the first place and that will come about. But if you end up doing pairwise comparisons like this, it's still important that you take multiple testing uh, correction into account. The, the Ronald Cosa quote is a really powerful one. And it is very important to me that you as growing scientists do not fool yourselves with your own data. Don't fool yourselves with your own data. Don't let it lead you astray. If you torture the data long enough, 
it will confess. Let's say that statistics is not your favorite area. What if you try doing a t-test um, with the Welch correction unpaired two-sided, and it didn't give you a p-value that you liked? Is it possible then to redo the test, this time saying, well, maybe the data were paired, clicking the paired checkbox and rerunning the test? Well, that still didn't give me a p-value. What if I say it's one-sided and the data are paired? Success! Then I get a p-value of 0.03. Is that OK? It's not OK. Don't torture your data into giving you the answer that you want. Design your, your statistical approach from the beginning and follow it. The data will support almost anything you want if you shove it hard enough. And we, we must not deceive ourselves with our own data. Lots of messages from this one. Microarrays have been giving way now to RNA-seq for some years. The reason for this is that you can do a lot of things with RNA-seq data that are not feasible with microarrays. I would also note, though, that RNA-seq data are a lot bigger and a lot more expensive to generate. There are plenty of times when using a microarray would be just fine. We should not lose track of those. Statistical considerations are inextricable from bioinformatics processing. This is the only day I'm going to be counting statistics like this, but the reality is that every day, statistics are a big issue in bioinformatics. Visualizing data via biclusters and volcano plots is very common in gene expression studies. If you read papers in this area, you're going to encounter both of them. Systems biology can easily yield situations where multiple testing is a problem. You don't have to be doing microarrays to run into multiple testing correction. Bonferroni and BHFDRs are a big, big help for that. 